So we'll go ahead and get started um, with the uh, webinar. Uh, and the, we start with a, uh, an agenda, which is uh, f relatively focused. This is one in a series of set webinars that we hope to give um, on this topic that gets a little bit more clinical and topical as, as, as we go on. So the uh, overall uh, plan for today is to show a case study uh, that really just kind of helps you think about um, the terminologies and, and alteration um, uh, discussions that we're having. Uh, and then we'll talk about genetic terminology and different types of genetic alterations and uh, modes of inheritance. And then we'll kind of come back to the case study to, to uh, revisit that and apply it a little bit. So uh, the, the case study is about a kiddo named Roger, who's a six-year-old boy uh, brought, to, brought by his mother because he's struggling in the first grade. His growth has fallen off, and he's the shortest in his class, but he's not super short. He's really just at the borderline at third percentile. He's had one seizure early in his life, and his head circumference is normal, but at the 95th percentile. His mother and father um, have normal intelligence by report, but his father is unemployed due to generalized weakness and pain. His mother's is of average stature, but his father is five foot four inches tall and stocky, and just for kicks, mother is pregnant. Um, uh, he's had some initial uh, workup, uh, ruling out other uh, short stature uh, causes like thyroid and growth hormone deficiency. Uh, and the pediatrician is kind of stumped at this point and wonders if he has an intellectual disability syndrome because of his, his difficulty in school, even though his appearance is basically pretty normal. So a genetics consultant um, is uh, engaged and detects mild brachydactyly, which is um, short fingers, uh, and uh, borderline upper-lower segment and arm span to height ratios. So those are ratios that we measure and calculate um, using a seamstress tape uh, that just has inches or centimeters on it, and then we use a little calculator to do that. Um, and these um, uh, differences indicate mild limb shortness, and so the genetics consultant thinks it might be a skeletal, skeletal dysplasia. There we go. All right. Um, so uh, a genetic test is ordered, FGFR3, which is the fibroblast growth factor receptor number three. Uh, gene sequencing is ordered, but the ordered test sequences only one exon and a specific exon, and it's targeted to detect two variants, C1620C to A and C1620C to G, uh, and it does not examine other FGFR3 exons, including exon 10, where the fully penetrant pathogenic variant responsible for achondroplasia is located. So uh, the gene test result confirms a heterozygous uh, mutation or variant, P asparagine 540 lysine. So the asparagine is changed at position 540 is changed to lysine, and the diagnosis uh, of hypochondroplasia is made. All right. So we're going to just just to keep this in the back of your mind as we go forward. So the discussion is a bunch of questions about, and this is again the preview to keep in your mind. Um, so the first question is why do the cDNA variants? Uh, and I'm going to get a pointer here, I think. Uh, why do the CDA variants um, both result in, in uh, the same protein variant? We'll answer these at the end. How many copies of the hypochondroplasia variant allele were found, and is this a dominant or a recessive disorder? How can Roger's diagnosis possibly help his father? Uh, only some persons with hypochondroplasia have intellectual disability. What two phenomena explain this? And the doctor could have ordered a complete radiographic survey, including skull, pelvis, AP and lateral spine, legs, arms, hands, instead of a genetic test to diagnose hypochondroplasia. So the question is, can you give three reasons why she might have chosen the genetic test over the radiographic diagnostic approach? And what did she risk by choosing the genetic test instead of the radiographic approach? Uh, okay. So uh, let's talk about um, the human genome, which is um, basically a whole bunch of DNA, uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, which is made up of um, two anti-parallel strands of a sugar phosphate background in the blue, and, uh, and uh, uh, base pairs that stick out between them and uh, hook together through hydrogen bonding, and the base pairs are specific. So uh, when uh, one base is an adenine, that always pairs with a thymine, 
when it's a cytosine, it always pairs with a guanine, uh, and and so forth. So the the human genome is all the genetic material in the nucleus plus the mitochondrial genome. And we'll talk more about that too. Molecules of DNA <clears throat> that contain the coded instructions for how to build, maintain, and replicate a human built being. So they're really kind of the blueprint. Um, DNA is not identical in in anyone but identical twins. And it always contains both benign variation and variations that can cause or contribute to disease. And even if they're only um, recessive diseases, we all have some kind of recessive variants there. And it's really big. It's 3.3 billion base pairs if you include everything. So um, chromosomes are uh, sort of the packets uh, in which the entire human genome is broken up into. So each chromosome is one strand of really, really long strand of DNA um, that is uh, uh, rolled up in histones uh, forming nucleosomes and then uh, twisted several times to its condensed state uh, during a cell division. It's in that condensed state that, to, that we recognize as that form or that shape of a chromosome, and it has uh, a P arm, which is the short arm, and the Q arm, which is the long arm. I always remember that as P for, if you speak French, it's P for petite, which means short in French, so that's how I remember it. And, uh, and when you um, uh, order a karyotype, which is shown on the left, um, you get these uh, uh, chromosome pictures with band, banded chromosomes, and there are 23 pairs of chromosomes, one pair from mom, one pair from dad, and one pair of sex chromosomes, so, tw so 22 pairs of autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes shown in the blue circle down here. That's the X and the Y in males and XX in females. So, and the chromosomes always have, they have a consistent structure, a consistent banding pattern, and, uh, and, and they're balanced. And I think that's a very important point is we're talking about a balanced, a normal person has a balanced amount of genetic material, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, that's really important. All right, the, um, uh, the gene is, is kind of the unit of structure that is encoded in the DNA. So you have chromosome, which is one long piece of DNA, uh, and within that you have segments uh, which are functional units called genes. And the gene uh, in, in uh, eukaryotes and humans and animals and plants and things like that uh, actually has subsegments which are exons that are interspersed between introns. And exons are kind of the business end because they contain primarily the coding material for the proteins. So um, when a gene is transcribed uh, and, uh, and, and, and sent out of the nucleus, the RNA that results will have the introns cut out and the, the eventual mRNA will only consist of the exons. Now, I wrote down here that it contains code for proteins you can have exons um, uh, early in the gene and late in the gene that don't code for protein portions, but they're important for, for regulation. Um, g interestingly, I think, is that the gene coding regions, all, if you add up all the exons in, in the genome, they're probably only about 1% of the entire genome. So how does this gene get expressed? Uh, some regulatory proteins come along, uh, up, usually upstream and in the gene, and say, okay, this is a gene that needs to be transcribed, it needs to be expressed, it needs to be uh, um, out there making something that's useful for this particular cell type. And so the DNA is copied to RNA in a process called transcription. Uh, and again, the transcription is like a copying process, so uh, that makes sense. And it's done by a protein called, or a complex called RNA polymerase and uh, you transcribe the backwards part of the DNA because these are complementary strands, and so you get a sense strand from the, of RNA from the anti-sense strand of DNA. And the next step is for the, that RNA to be exported from the cytoplasm uh, into the, I mean, sorry, exported from the nucleus, excuse me, into the cytoplasm. Uh, and actually into the endoplasmic reticulum where this huge machine called a ribosome uh, is uh, uh, um, uh, taking that RNA and the, the information encoded in the RNA that was copied from the DNA and turning that into proteins. And it does that uh, by um, uh, grabbing these transfer RNAs which have specific amino acids um, uh, tied to 
their three, um, uh, three base pair code, and they match that up with the codon in the mRNA. Uh, and, and then the, uh, the amino acid is added to this growing polypeptide chain, which eventually becomes the protein. So we're translating the code in the mRNA to a protein code. And that's sort of described down here in this inset where uh, um, you have a start codon here, and then you have different codons that are coding for different amino acids, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the codon UAA um, uh, is the stop codon, and uh, that tells the ribosome, I'm done, don't add any more, any more amino acids, uh, and let me go, I'm a free protein now. Um, so if the, if the stop codon doesn't show up or if a, a mutation or a, a variation results in a stop codon earlier in the gene, then that will result in early termination of the protein chain. Okay. Um, let me go back here and just say proteins, um, you know, what do proteins do? Proteins are really the, the things that were, are, are important in making... Uh, making cells, making them, making them work, uh, and they they uh, have a lot of different types of functions. They can be structural elements. They can be enzymes that that catalyze biochemical reactions and building uh, building um, um, uh, other things, including proteins that are involved in the ribosome and and so forth. Um, they can be proteins that are regulatory factors. Uh, both inside the out cell and outside the cell. They can be receptors, they can be signaling molecules, they can be hormones, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of different ways that proteins can be uh, I I important, uh, but their information is all encoded in, in the genome. All right. So um, let's go on to a little bit different um, uh, phase where we're talking about some terminology and distinguishing between genotype and phenotype. So genotype is the genetic code that describes an individual. So if, if, if I can describe my uh, human genome and say it has these variants in it, that's my genotype. And the genotype um, sh should include information from both copies of the DNA for any particular gene or, or region. So I got one copy from mom and one copy from my dad. So I have two different copies, and they don't always have the same variants. They shouldn't, in fact. Um, and, and so when you describe a genotype, you're, you're describing both uh, copies, and it's the entire one. Now, you can use the word genotype to describe what's going on in a particular gene, and then you're talking about what are the two different alleles, what are the two different sort of cassettes that fit into uh, that gene that were inherited from mom and dad. Um, and then phenotype is the physical manifestation of the genotype in an individual. So we may not know the genotype, but we can assess the phenotype. That's what a clinical exam or a radiologic uh, uh, exam or some other general laboratory test may be. That will tell us something about the phenotype. So the only <laughs> diagram that I could find to, to, that, that addresses this is, is one having to do with fruit flies. So forgive me for that. Um, but in this, in this slide, the phenotypes are normal wings or wrinkled, wrinkled wings. And the only one with the wrinkled wings are the ones that have a, a homozygous recessive genotype for small w, which is basically a loss, a loss of function mutation, okay? The heterozygous, the, those with the genotypes of homozygous normal, large w, or heterozygous large w, small w, um, all have the same phenotype. So. Um, you have to understand those differences in how genotype can lead to phenotype. All right. So um, moving on to more uh, important terminology, um, and that has to do with genetic heterogeneity. Heterogeneity means that things are, you know, things are not all homo homogeneous. They're not all the same. So um, there are different types of heterogeneity. Allelic heterogeneity is disease that results from different variants in the same gene. So um, a variant is a mutate, what we used to call a mutation, we now call a variant. So that's an A to C or a, a deletion or something like that. So um, allelic heterogeneity means you can get the same, um, same disease from various different mutations or, or variants in the same gene, okay? Locus heterogeneity, locus is uh, 
uh, which gene are we talking about here? Is this the, uh, the NF1 gene or is it the NF2 gene, for example? So a particular disease can result from variants in different genes. Uh, and an example of that is dilated cardiomyopathy. So you can have a dilated cardiomyopathy in a family and you can't distinguish that phenotypically in one family from another family, but it can be caused by different genes. Um, so that's an example of locus heterogeneity. I'm going back to the allelic heterogeneity. Uh, an example is hypochondroplasia, which is in our case uh, where most but not all um, uh, patients with, with hypochondroplasia have uh, uh, one, or two, uh, one of two or three different variants in that gene, but there are at least 54 different alleles that have been associated with hypochondroplasia. Phenotypic heterogeneity means that disease manifestations are different in different people. Um, so uh, in, in, the, in the, the hypochondroplasia case that I mentioned at the beginning, um, the father is of normal intelligence, and we're going to presume for the moment that the father actually has hypochondroplasia as well and was never diagnosed, and he has no intellectual disability, but his son does. So here's another term which is um, uh, sometimes difficult to, to uh, uh, um, capture, I think, its, its meaning, and that is the expressivity of a gene. So um, expressivity is, or expression is used in different manners. So a disease expression is what the detectable disease manifestations are in an affected individual. So usually that means the phenotype. Well, you can kind of see if you've done a thorough physical exam. Um, that's the disease expression. So that's the disease, the, the disease features that you see. Um, some people will extend that and say, well, you have to go to a, to a cellular or molecular level. So, for example, um, uh, in, in sickle cell, an individual with the disease may not have a phenotype if they're having, if they're not having any problems, but you may be able to see uh, differences in their hemoglobin or even uh, some sickle cells rolling around in their blood. Uh, and that would be an, another example of a disease expression if you look deep enough. Um, so variable expressivity is affected persons can show different features or different combinations of features. So just because you have one disease doesn't mean that you're always going to show the same set of features. Some people may show, um, uh, show one set of features and other people may show a different set of features. And, and that brings me to patterns, because even within families where diseases are inherited, um, there may be variation due to unknown factors, despite the fact that it's an inherited gene and the gene is all the same in all the members of the family who are affected with that disease, but also among families, and that brings up the concept of genotype-phenotype correlation. So different families may have, may be passing along different variants in that gene, and so they have a different genotype and that may be responsible for the phenotype. So you can begin to, uh, in some disorders, you can begin to say, well, if they have this particular mutation or this particular variant that's causing their disease, then they're more likely to have um, a, a particular set of features or phenotype than a, a different variant in that gene. So here's another uh, a term which is important to try to understand, and that's penetrance. So penetrance uh, refers to uh, um, the frequency with which people who have the genotype that is typical of that disease will actually express that disease. So there are some conditions um, like um, a, a breast cancer predisposition gene where although you have that predisposition gene, you only have, uh, say, an 80% chance of getting breast cancer in your lifetime. That's a really high chance, but that means that there's 20% who don't, who, and those 20% would be called non-penetrant, okay? So complete penetrance is everybody with the pathogenic genotype expresses the disease. That's here, okay? Uh, incomplete penetrance is where some but not all will express the disease. And there are a number of sort of patterns that you can see in that. One is lifelong. So um, uh, when you get that genotype uh, at birth, you or, you know, at, at conception, then um, you may never, ever, ever get that get that condition. Okay, doesn't matter how old you are or what you're exposed to. Um, it, it it's not going to happen in a fraction of people. The next one is age-related penetrance, uh, which is, for example, early onset Alzheimer's, genetic Alzheimer's disease. 
uh, where um, you don't have uh, expression of the disease until you're older, right? So you're not penetrant until you're of an age where you start being penetrant, if that makes any sense. That's age-related penetrant. And there's also environment-dependent penetrance where if you're not exposed to the inciting agent, for example, uh, one of the, the medications or drugs that has uh, a, a subpopulation that are particularly susceptible to it uh, for adverse effects, you won't be affected. So if you're never exposed to that, then you're not you're not um, um, expressed. So in the in the context of the case that I presented, um, I'm just going to read this um, uh, clip from GeneReviews.org about hypochondroplasia, because because of evidence that height range and hypochondroplasia may overlap that of normal population, individuals with hypochondroplasia may not be recognized as having a skeletal dysplasia. They may not get a diagnosis unless an astute physician recognizes their disproportionate short stature. It's that short limb bit uh, that I talked about earlier. However, there have been no reports of individuals with an FGFR3 mutation without de demonstrable radiographic changes compatible with hypochondroplasia or one of the other phenotypes known to be associated with mutations in this GCD. Okay, there are at least 13 different phenotypes associated with mutations in FGFR3. So that's one, one component. But the point that's being made here is that if you only look at how tall an individual is, um, you will think that hypochondroplasia has incomplete penetrance. If you look at whether they have um, disproportionate uh, short stature uh, um, or, or their limbs are disproportionate in length to their, to their trunk, um, then you will have a higher penetrance level. If you look with x-ray at whether they have the characteristic um, radiologic findings, then that will be 100% penetrant even in a person with normal stature and really not very impressive short limbs, okay? So I hope that um, is uh, uh, clear. All right, we had talked about um, this genetic code before, so I'm kind of for, uh, circling back to that and to talk about types of um, genetic alterations or, or variants. So um, I've, I've used the word variant, I've used the word mutation uh, a couple of times here, and, and the mutation uh, terminology is on the way out. We tend to use variant or pathogenic variant. Uh, as our standard terminology now, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So um, the, this is about the genetic code, and this is the, t the standard table of genetic code. It is universal. Wherever there's DNA encoding things, this is the genetic code that's used. Um, it relies on a three-base pattern, uh, which encodes one amino acid or the termination, which is stop in here. Okay. Um, it is degenerate, which is to say that there are more than one set of, for, for a number of amino acids, not all, but for a number of them, there are multiple codon sets that can encode that single amino acid. So, for example, here you can have a codon which is UCU, UCC, UCA, or UCG, which all will encode Siri, okay? So you can actually have a mutation or a change in the third position of the codon and not change the amino acid. Right, and that's called a synonymous variation. Okay, so it doesn't change the amino acid in the protein, and so is much less likely, although not certain, to cause a problem with that protein. Okay, um, and then there are actually additional, and with serine, there are additional ones. So you can have a difference in the first position, and uh, still encode uh, ser ser um, serine as well. All right. So what this brings up is. Uh, the fact that if if you um, uh, have a that the, let me back up if the tra that, the, that the translation of uh, a protein from R messenger RNA is reading frame dependent so if you shift the reading frame the position of each of these bases in the codon um, then uh, by having an insertion or deletion of a multiple of anything but three uh, then you can shift the frame and everything after that point is translated into different amino acids because the codons are, are uh, telling the ribosome to add a different amino acid at, at that position. So this is what's known as a frame shift variant or a frame shift mutation. All right, so uh, uh, fr from the, at the DNA level, so that's kind of the effect of the mutation. At the DNA level, here are the different things and different ways that you can mess up a gene. So here is a nice base pair G and C, and if the G 
uh, is the target of a mutagenic event, um, then you can have a deletion over here where the G is missing, and you might end up with a frame shift, as I just discussed, okay? You can have an insertion where there's an extra uh, base inserted there, an A in front of the G, and then you obviously, because it's paired, you get a T on the other strand, and you can have a frame shift mutation there, for example. Um, and then you can just get a substitution where, where there isn't any new, I mean, extra base or missing base. It's just that the G, instead of being a G, is now an A. And then on the opposite strand, once you replicate that strand, it becomes fixed and the opposite strand will be a T, of course. Okay, so those are things that can happen right at the small level. At the macro level on the chromosomes, which these diagrams represent, you can have a deletion, meaning a segment um, is, that is normally there is missing, and you end up with a, a, a decreased copy number of those genes that are in that segment. You can have a duplication, uh, meaning, um, and often it's a tandem duplication as shown here, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, and you can have an inversion where uh, a segment of DNA is just flipped. And the inversions are less likely to cause problems, although you're, do, you're breaking and reconnecting DNA at two points there. And if that interrupts a gene or puts a gene in a place it wasn't before with different regulation or fuses two genes together, then you can still have a problem. Um, substitution. Uh, is where uh, something goes in and replaces something else. It's just sort of moving from one chromosome to another. And a translocation is another form of moving uh, something from one chromosome to another. In this case, it's reciprocal. The red portion is going on to the chromosome that originally had the green on it, and the green portion is going on uh, where the red originally was. And the, the importance of the translocations is whether, really whether or not it's balanced. If it's, a, if it's an equal swap, um, there's generally um, very low likelihood of effect, although when that gets passed on to the next generation, the chromosomes may not pair properly, and you may end up with an imbalanced chromosome set in an offspring. Okay, so I'm just going to go over that some different types of variants. is base, subst base substitution, one base replaces another. Copy number variants, a deletion where you've lost a copy. Uh, uh, duplication or triplication where you've gained a copy. So these are called copy number variants. The usual copy number is two, except in a male where you're talking about the X chromosome where the usual number is one. Uh, and these are called copy number variants or C and Vs. You'll hear C and V talked about. Uh, repeat number uh, is uh, important uh, for because it re repeats tend to cause mutations or cause deletions, duplications through a number of genetic mechanisms, um, and they can be tandem, meaning they, they are both oriented, to both repeats are oriented in the same direction. They can be flanking, uh, meaning that they're on either side of a region. The flanking ones are, are ones that tend to cause deletions like the 22Q11 recurring deletion. Um, uh, they can be a direct, uh, a direct orientation repeat or an inverted repeat. And the size can be, you know, as large as you want, as the whole, you know, a whole chromosome, part of a chromosome, down to um, uh, trinucleotide um, segments. And the trinucleotides are, are an important class because there's a whole class of, of uh, you know, genetic disorders such as Huntington's, Fragile X, and a number of neurologic disorders, which are due to trinucleotide repeat expansions. Um, there are also structural variations, re rearrangements, and sections DNA, of DNA moved around. Uh, that's in the previous slide, as well as translocation. I think the, the really the, the most important take-home lesson from, from this slide is that um, all these different types of variation are not detected by single te technology. So you have to use different laboratory technologies to detect these different types of variation, all of which can mess up a gene and cause a disease. So if you're using just one of a technology um, to uh, try to understand what's gone on in a genetic disease, you may be missing something because there may be variations of different types that disrupt that gene that are not detected by the, by the technology that you're using. See if I can hit that small button up there. All right. Um, this, the next two slides really are trying to um, uh, connect the interaction of variation with function. So uh, a, a gene or a protein has a function. Variation in that uh, may have the potential to cause a, um, a difference. Uh, 
and that difference may, may depend upon what environment that variation is found in. And the function can have several different categories, loss of function, function, for example, in recesses or in haploinsufficiency in dominant disorders. Um, more function, a gain of function. A new function is also called a gain of function uh, or no change at all, so a benign variant that um, uh, we wouldn't have known anything about it except we sequenced somebody's gene or genome. Now, uh, this, this slide gets into the importance of dosage uh, in this interaction between function and variation. Uh, and and the dose, if the dose is insufficient to, to give you a normal function for that particular gene, then it is a, a, a loss of function. And that, again, can be you don't have any insufficient, meaning you don't have any, or insufficient, meaning you need two copies worth and you've only got one copy worth. And those are res recessive and dominant molecular patterns, um, uh, respectively. Um, an excess of function is usually, a, or a gain of function, uh, for example, due to a duplication or triplication of a gene or a mutation that causes um, an activation of a gene that's normally under regulation, and those are usually dominant. Um, a, a neomorph is something where there's a new mutation, I mean, where, the, where the mutation causes, say, an enzyme which used to convert uh, chemical A to chemical B. To, instead of converting chemical A to chemical B, it converts chemical C to chemical D now, and D happens to be oncogenic, for example. So that's a neomorph. Uh, and then um, uh, if there's just enough, then it's benign. So that's, that's sort of what the balance is about um, that I was talking about earlier. Okay. Um, modes of inheritance. We can figure out modes of inheritance in several ways. Uh, we can infer them from a pedigree or family history tree. We can predict them from the functional effect of a pathogenic variant that I was just talking about. And we may need in that process to correct for lethality. So, for example, if a dominant disorder is lethal uh, in young life, um, it's not going to be seen in a family in a, in a, in a transmitted fashion because it's not transmitted on because the person who had it died before they could pass it on. Um, and also, you need to think about whether it's a germline typical inherited disease pattern or whether it's somatic mutations or variations that are found in tumors. So obviously, if it's found in a tumor and it's not in the regular DNA of the person, then the inheritance pattern is kind of irrelevant, okay? So uh, the different, let's start with the, the um, dominant inheritance pattern. And the diagram here is a pedigree or a family health history. And the affected individuals are marked um, by uh, being uh, darkened here. And uh, of course, uh, boys are squares and girls are females. Uh, and the oldest generation is at the top, youngest generation towards the bottom. So the, the characteristics of dominant inheritance are that affected individuals affect both sexes equally on average. Uh, and if you know what is going on at the genotype level, one of the two alleles of the disease gene is bad. Uh, in an unaffected individual, there's no disease allele, so neither copy of the disease gene is bad. And since they don't have a bad copy, they can't pass it on. It, doesn't be tra it isn't transmitted from one generation to the next. So, for example, this guy here isn't affected, doesn't have the gene, and has all kids who don't have that disorder. Another characteristic of dominant inheritance is a vertical pattern, uh, which means that you see this in multiple generations and, and you don't see a lot of um, generation skipping. It, it tends to be passed down from one generation to the next. Uh, and, and on average, an affected person will have a 50-50 chance of transmitting it, so 50% of the people who are at risk of inheriting the disease will get it on average. With autosomal recessive inheritance, some people talk about this as having two bad copies of the gene. You get, you, you, you get one bad copy from mom and one bad copy from dad. Um, but it, from a functional standpoint, really the operational uh, definition is that you don't have a normal copy. You don't have a backup copy, okay, that's good, that can provide this function um, that, that's missing in the mutated or, or variant allele, okay? Um, uh, in an unaffected individual, you will have at least one normal copy. 
So that's the criteria for being unaffected is that you have a normal copy of that gene. In a carrier, um, the carriers are generally unaffected in recessive disorders, and they have a 50-50 chance of transmitting. There's a couple of diagrammatic representations of being a carrier. In, in this slide, the dot is what is used to represent a carrier uh, for a particular disorder. The last characteristic is that both parents of an, of, of an affected person are carriers, or they can be affected, but that's pretty rare. So this guy down here is the affected person in this pedigree, and by definition, both of his biologic parents, not as adopted parents, but as biologic parents, are carriers. Um, and uh, so th those are the primary characteristics of autosomal recessive inheritance. So let's talk about another recessive, X-linked recessive, and remind you that the X chromosome uh, is this strange beast that's uh, uh, present in two copies in females, in one copy in males, because males have instead this tiny little guy called the Y chromosome, which um, is important for making the male. So um, an affected individual with X-linked recessive inheritance has no normal copy, are generally males, because the male with an X passes on only his X to his daughters and the X is mutated or, or, or abnormal, all of his daughters will be carriers because he passes on his Y to make his sons. All the sons are unaffected and can't pass on the disorder. And here I have it's it, it, that males are affected but rarely females and that's a, a more complex subject we can go to in the Q&A if you want to, but the important point is you cannot absolutely rule out some X-linked recessive disorders expressing themselves in females. Um, the unaffected people have at least one normal copy, same as an autosomal recessive. Um, they are the non-carrier males and most females, right? The carriers are typically unaffected, but there can be subtle manifestations in some disorders, and, uh, and these are the females or males who have an extra backup copy, so males with Klinefelter syndrome or XXY, all right? Um, and uh, these individuals will transmit, the females will transmit at a 50-50 uh, ratio. The mother of an affected person, so remember in, in autosomal recessive, both parents of affected had to be carriers. In X-linked recessive, the mother is an affected, the mother of an affected is a carrier, but not always. And that's a, a real little tricky thing. So if it's a benign condition, like I have X-linked um, uh, 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 color blindness, right? And um, so I'm always going to inherit that from my mother, and my mother's always going to be a carrier for that. When the affected males are um, uh, such that the affected status prevents them from reproducing, then the, the population dynamics results in a high frequency of new mutations. And so you can predict that the mother will have two out of three, two out of three of the mothers will be a carrier, but one of three out of them won't be. So you may actually have to test mother to determine whether or not she's a carrier in X-linked recessive disorders. All right, how about Y-linked? There are some Y-linked um, um, disorders. They're quite um, unusual um, because most of what's on the Y chromosome is junk. Okay, there is, there's, there's the, uh, the, the male determining region and a few things, and then a few genes that are on the, the very tip of the, of the Y chromosome that are also on the very tip of the X chromosome that are called the pseudoautosomal regions because um, they are copied um, on, on both and act just like autosomes. All right, mitochondrial inheritance, and I think we're um, getting to the end here is uh, in both sexes are affected. There's a lot of variable expression. The we're talking about inherit inheritance of the small round um, uh, uh, circle of DNA, which is in I I intrinsic to the mitochondria and encodes some of the mitochondrial genes. Others are encoded in the nucleus of the cell and are migrated into the mitochondria. It has also vertical transmission, but it's maternal lineage only and never transmitted for males because the mitochondria are only transmitted via the egg, never via the sperm. 
And the other way you can notice mitochondrial inheritance is that it, the phenotype in, deals with the energy-intensive organs cause, because the mitochondria, the mitochondrial deficiency, is uh, mitochondria are energy producers for the cell, and cells that consume a lot of energy are the ones that are going to be sick fastest. Um, and, and then the last sort of pattern of mutation is de novo, or new mutation, new variation in the family. There's no family history in, in the dominant situation. It's not present in DNA of either parent when you go looking, and is generally considered to be supporting evidence that the, that the variant that is new is, it could be pathogenic if it's associated with a disease. It's not um, ironclad, but it is supportive evidence. So I'm going to um, come back to the case study and just summarize this. So um, Roger is a short, slow uh, kiddo with bigger head. Uh, he has a family history where his father has some weakness and pain and is a bit short. Um, he had a genetics uh, consult which found some phenotypic differences that suggested a skeletal dysplasia. And the genetic test was done uh, that, show, uh, that showed a a uh, heterozygous uh, variant that predicted a protein um, uh, difference of asparagine 540 to lysine. So we'll go through now um, the, the questions, if I can get that click to work. Um, why do the CD variants variants C1620, C to A, and C1620, C to G both result in the protein, same protein variant? How many copies of the hypochondroplasia variant allele were found? How can Roger's diagnosis help his father? Only some persons with hypochondroplasia have intellectual disability. And why did the doctor choose this particular um, uh, uh, approach? So uh, the answers are that the cDNA, uh, I'm sorry, that, that these two variants occur at the same position, one going from C to A and the other from C to G. And as we talked about earlier, um, you can have uh, get a, an asparagine to lysine by going from C to A or C to G due to the degenerate coson, codon um, in the uh, genetic code. How many copies of hypochondroplasia variant allele were found? Is this a dominant recessive disorder? So there's one variant allele and one normal allele in the ATBP binding segment of the FGFR3 tyrosine kinase domain. So the test result was heterozygous for the disease-associated variant, meaning there's one disease-associated variant, and that's compared with the normal reference sequence. Hypochondroplasia is a dominant disorder, both by inference from pedigrees and by the biologic basis, which is a constitu constitutive activation of the receptor tyrosine kinase, a gain of function. Okay, how can Roger's diagnosis possibly help his father? Father's short stature and stocky build suggests that Roger may have inherited hypochondroplasia from him. A significantly increased incidence of spinal stenosis and bony compression occurs in this disorder. So Roger's diagnosis might lead to diagnosis in father and detection of and surgery for spinal stenosis. So Roger's father might recover from his pain and disability, which would be a really great thing. And this, I put this in here as an example of how genetic testing is, is in some ways, um, in, in one very important way, very different from regular kinds of uh, laboratory testing, and that is it has um, potentially important um, carry-on implications for other family members. So its, its value actually is not just to the patient, but to um, the entire family. So uh, the uh, next question was, only some persons with hypochondroplasia have intellectual disability, and what two phenomena explain this? One would be variable expressivity. So we did talk about that. Um, so that's where one individual with the disorder may have a certain pattern of expression, certain pattern of features, whereas another individual, even in the same family, may not have the same pattern. So that's variable expressivity. It makes it difficult sometimes to determine when you take a family history whether uh, whether there's really something going on in the family that's dominant or not because um, they have different manifestations. So, for example, in in a, in a BRCA family, you may have people with breast cancer uh, uh, that 
but other people with, with ovarian cancer only. And in the early days, we didn't recognize that those were part of the same disorder, and so we didn't recognize that they needed to be counted together in terms of figuring out whether this was a dominant at-risk inherited family. So the other uh, type thing phenomenon is genotype-phenotype correlation, and we mentioned that. So the particular um, variant, disease-associated variant, in this case of hypochondroplasia, is associated with a higher incidence of intellectual disability, not 100%, but a higher incidence of intellectual disability than some other variants that also cause hypochondroplasia. All right. So. Um, the last one was about um, why did why why didn't he or why didn't the doctor order all these X-rays instead? And and the answer is that the complete this whole complete radiologic survey is necessary to diagnose hypochondroplasia, and the radiation exposure is significant. And even then, radiologic diagnosis can be difficult, and depending on the experience of the radiologist and others. So um, I'm getting the signal. I need to wrap it up. So the the second point is that gene test is less expensive. Uh, two to three hundred dollars for a single exon, uh, and the tested for a variant is associated with intellectual disability. So if we find this variant, then we believe we've explained his intellectual disability, and we don't have to look deeper to try to explain and say, well, he has a skeletal dysplasia, but we haven't still explained his intellectual disability. We can probably stop there. So that's a that's a, a plus. So I'm going to move on um, because we need to um, get to questions. And so I'll thank you for your attention and for your patience. And we are really uh, interested in your feedback since we're starting this as a pilot and uh, to see how useful this kind of thing is and whether there are changes in the format or uh, the approach that can be useful to you guys. And uh, these are just some resources uh, that I used in the case, um, case uh, study development. And I'll stop there.